Good morning. Uh, we are down to our last two budget bills, uh, education and uh, transportation. If, as you all know, we were here past 3 a.m. last night. Uh, uh, we, we made a commitment. We wanted to get done with all budget bills in the House and Senate by today, and, and both the House and the Senate are going to have that done. Uh, again, another step that we've completed towards the end. And so particularly proud about these two bills. The education bill uh, spends $900 million more money than where we're at now. And stealing a little bit of Senator Nelson's thunder, this is the largest education bill we've ever had. And, and then Senator Newman's going to talk about transportation. It's a very good transportation bill. Uh, we prioritize transportation. Uh, we just don't do it with any of the gas tax, the tab fee in increase. Uh, the sales tax increase on buying a car, we're not doing it with any of that. But with that, Senator Nelson will kick off E-12 education. Thank you, Senator Gazelka. Well, good morning. It's uh, great to see you here. I am State Senator Carla Nelson from Olmstead County. And uh, I'm glad to be here today to talk to you about Senate File 7, the Education, Finance, and Policy Bill. And uh, before I jump into that, it, let me just say it does not escape my notice that today I'm standing here with Senator Newman and the transportation bill. And you know, transportation and education are two integral parts of our Constitution. And we know that uh, our very form of democracy depends on educated citizenry. And Senator Newman can talk to you about why transportation is in the Constitution. But let me just tell you that, uh, yes, Senate File 7 uh, is the largest education funding bill if it passes off the Senate floor today, which we think it will, it will be the largest uh, education funding bill uh, ever uh, passed in our state off the Senate floor. Uh, also, uh, you might know that uh, it does it's about a $19.78 billion budget. That is with a B. It's the largest part of our state budget, about 41% of our state budget. But most importantly, it funds our students. It funds the future. And that's why I'm glad to uh, be with, your, with you here today. As you know, in the uh, Minnesota Senate, we focus on students and we fund what works. You are going to see that the largest part of our funding bill reflects some of our key priorities. One of those is students. $93 million of new increased money on the per pupil <clears throat> formula. We know that kids cannot learn if they don't feel safe. Every parent, every student, every teacher, every school professional needs to know when they walk in that school building, it is as secure as possible. We invest $75 million in safe schools. That includes safe schools as in the building itself, how to make that building and campus more secure, and safe schools in the people cost, those internal people that make our schools and our students safer. Things like counselors, social workers, nurses, school resource officers. And the beauty about the new aid that is in Senate File 7, it is called Safe Schools Revenue. It goes to every school. There is a floor, so our smallest schools also get significant funding. It's on a per pupil basis. And most importantly, as I said, it covers both the internal and the external needs as far as school safety. And of course, if we want things to be effective, we know that the best decisions are made at the local level. And our local school districts will determine how best to spend those safe school dollars within the allowed uses in law. There's about 10 or 11 of them. So that is critical. In addition, we know that if we want our students to succeed, be ready for tomorrow, the workforce tomorrow, be ready to live uh, productive lives, we know that they have to have a great education. And let me tell you, we know now that starts in the early years. In the Minnesota Senate Education Bill, as you might know, there are 4,000 voluntary pre-K spots that are set to expire. They were one-time funding, and without uh, what we're doing here today, those 4,000 students would not be able to get that high quality, quality early education that is so important. The Senate funds those in a way that has proven to be very effective. It's called the Minnesota model. 
States across the nation are emulating this model. That is the early learning scholarship model that provides funding to, on a targeted basis, to students who would not otherwise be able to have a high quality early learning. It provides parent choice, and most importantly, it has had phenomenal success. You might remember uh, Art Rolnick, uh, one of the leaders uh, in this area, as well as the former Senator Dwayne Benson. Uh, so we are fully funding those uh, voluntary pre-K spots, although it is with a targeted dollars, and most importantly, parents get to choose. They can choose if their children go to the pre-VPK site that was already in place, or those parents might choose to send their child to center-based care, family child care, uh, church uh, child care, as long as all of those places are on the road to quality with our quality rating system. So that's a plus. And then lastly, uh, we focus on literacy. Uh, we have over 40% of our kids that graduate from this state that are not literate. They are not proficient in reading. That is a burden that no one should need to go into the world with. We need our kids to be able to read and to read well. And we have focused significantly on early literacy and early literacy that works. So I could talk for a long time, but I'd encourage you to come to the Senate floor. Uh, but those are some of the high items, and I'll turn it over to Senator Newman. Well, good morning, everyone. Senator Scott Newman. Uh, as long as Senator Nelson uh, invited me to, I will comment on the Constitution, and that's what makes the Senate Transportation Bill uh, somewhat unique amongst all of the other omnibus bills, and that is within transportation, we do have constitutionally dedicated funds, which I'm sure all of you are aware of. And the Constitution says that uh, uh, we, are, we are going to provide dedicated funding, funding for highway purposes and that we have, uh, we're going to establish a highway uh, user distribution fund into which we are going to pour the constitutionally dedicated funds and then distribute it out for use uh, in building our infrastructure. And that's a pretty interesting and important concept to remember because um, uh, we are unique in that respect. So in terms of the current transportation uh, uh, bill, the, the funding for it uh, will be approximately $6.8 billion in each of the next two bienniums. Uh, and that, of course, is not an insignificant sum. That is uh, generated by the constitutionally dedicated money. And in addition to that, there is approximately $458 million in general funds that uh, goes into the HUTDF fund uh, that we uh, created in 2017. So between the, uh, those two sources of money and then some other uh, much smaller uh, special revenue funds, uh, we have got a total of $6.8 billion uh, to spend in the next, uh, in each, I should say, of the next two bienniums. And, um, the, the, the funding and the need for infrastructure and a transportation system, at least in my opinion, uh, is of paramount importance. Uh, without a good transportation system, the students that Senator Nelson is so par passionate about can't get to school. Uh, we need a good transportation system in order to uh, get to the doctor, to get to the grocery store, uh, our economic vitality of this state is dependent on a transportation uh, infrastructure. Uh, we know that uh, our infrastructure is aging, and uh, we do have to pay attention to that. Uh, and that is exactly what we have uh, attempted to do, to do in our transportation bill. Anticipating uh, your questions, uh, there is no gas tax increase in this bill. There is no license tab fee increase in this bill. And I would note uh, and stop there that within the governor's request, there are four separate 
increases just within the tab fees on your automobiles. There is uh, no increase in the sales tax on automobiles in this bill. And uh, in my opinion, if we were to take that amount of money, which, uh, which would total $1.5 billion in the next biennium and $2.5 billion in the following biennium, directly out of the pockets of the people who are driving cars. Those are the people that would have to pay this. I think we cripple the economy in the state of Minnesota. And uh, it, the, the, the funding, that particular approach, uh, is simply not necessary and it's not something that I am interested in. So with that, uh, the, the transportation bill will be on the floor in the Senate this afternoon. And uh, uh, I would invite all of you to attend. Questions for either of those, either chair, and then I'll take questions. Chair, what's in the what's in the Senate uh, bill for transit? The the, the base funding uh, is what is in the Senate Transportation uh, Bill for transit, roads, bridges. Uh, all of it is the base funding. So no increase. No increase. What is the increase for um, the boost in transportation assistance for so small cities? Can you spe um, give us more detail on that? There was a small amount of money left on the bottom line. Uh, I want to say it was like a half a million dollars or thereabouts, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and one of the problems that we have with our, this HUTDF fund is small cities. Those are cities under 5,000 uh, uh, do not receive any of that funding. And yet they have transportation needs also. So uh, in 2017, we did try to give the small cities a, a boost by putting some money and targeting those small cities. We had a little bit of extra money on the bottom line, and, and that's where we decided to it, sell. What does it give them, bus service or what roads? What, what does it go for? What does it go for? Yeah. It goes to small cities for their streets and bridges, et cetera, with their small city infrastructure within the small uh, the confines of the small cities defined by cities under 5,000. <clears throat> Senator, Senator Newman, I think you said that the uh, uh, 2017 system is supporting a lot of this new transportation spending. Does the legislature have to authorize use of that money, or if you guys pass nothing this year, would the money continue to flow into these road projects? Uh, in a nutshell, we have to appropriate it. That's also true for the ban on using state money for operating funds for future light rail lines. Is that current law, or does that need to be reinstituted? Could you rephrase your question? Your, your prohibition in, on using state money to subsidize the operating costs oh. of new light rail lines. Is yeah. that current law, or does that need to be reinstituted? What you're referring to is current law, which requires this, the state of Minnesota to pay 50% of the operating costs of light rail. Two years ago, we prohibited uh, the use of money for Southwest light rail, but we didn't address any future light rail. In this bill, there is a prohibition on any future light rail, whereby the city, or I'm sorry, the state would be on the hook for that 50% operating cost. So that's actually a reduction in state funding for public for transit? Senator, Senator Newman, I'd like you to get a little more clarity on what we allowed counties to do related to the sales tax and light rail. Oh. Because I want you to have a full picture. Yeah, that. sure. Uh, and, and what Senator Gazelka is referring to is we have allowed the, uh, the, the counties uh, to impose a uh, local option sales tax that they would be then able to use for uh, developing the light rail, if that's what they so choose to, to do. Uh, what we are trying to do, or at least what I am trying to do, is to get the state of Minnesota out of the business of light rail. Uh, however, having said that, if, if uh, the, and we're talking the metropolitan area, if they decide, the, the folks in the metropolitan area decide uh, to pay for light rail with a local option sales tax, that's up to them. Is there an amount attached to that? Half cent? Half cent. Cent? A half that's cent? the current authorization after they dissolve CTIB and they double their, that's the current, you're not giving them additional authority. No, after CTIB we gave them that authority. After oh, CTIB, so this is not something dis new. After CTIB dissolved. So the House, the House version took away the dedication of the, the auto related sales tax, they took that out of their transport bills, I understand it. So is this something you're trying to negotiate back in? I, I mean, this is going to be one of the 
the bargaining points, I guess. Well, I would think that you know maybe that that provision and, and a number of other provisions are likely to uh, to come up in the conference committee, um, and uh, you know we'll just have to address it at that time. I'm not going to try and predict, uh, you know, what is going to happen. Uh, obviously, our bills are quite different, uh, but I can tell you that I look forward to uh, working with uh, Representative Hornstein. Uh, we have worked well together in the past, and and I expect that we will continue to do just that in the future. What's the rationale for no increase for um, base funding for transit? I'm sorry? What's the rationale behind not giving them an increase uh, in funding for transit for the next two years? The, the, uh, the target that I have uh, d does not provide for any additional funding <laughs> for transit uh, or, or any of the other uh, why not? Why not? Because we we simply don't have the money. It's just that simple. So what's the hybrid uh, electric vehicle tax that you have in the bill? What's that at now? Uh, the on the hybrid, I believe it's a hundred dollars, and on the pure electric, it's two hundred. That's lower. And that is and the, that that is a a tax in lieu of the gas tax. That, that's less of an increase in. Initially proposed, it was 250 to go to 250, and then 125. So, is there an agreement that, with Democrats there, or no? No. Uh, first question, uh, you are correct. It was at 250, uh, and was uh, you know within the committee structure reduced to uh, the 200 dollars figure. Uh, there is no agreement that I am aware of uh, as to where the House stands on that issue. I would suspect it would be an issue of uh, coming up in the conference committee. Senator Nelson, just, just doing the math here, which I know is always dangerous, uh, looks like you guys are $680 million below what the House has passed for P through 12. How do you, how do you get, get there? Well, uh, first let me uh, add to that, as you're looking at those differences in numbers, uh, there's a couple things you will not see that you do not see in the uh, E-12 education budget. One, you do not see any tax increases. Uh, our education budget, even with its 5.1% increase, does not rely on increased taxes. Nor does the education budget include any property taxes, any new uh, levies on our, on our, for our school districts. And then uh, thirdly, just um, in addition to the number side, uh, this uh, budget does not include any new unfunded mandates on our schools, things that were controversial or um, caused controversy uh, with the Minnesota Associated School Boards. So uh, there is a difference uh, in funding. And uh, let me just say that uh, historically, uh, that's what happens in conference committees, uh, is the conference committees come together. I'm really looking forward to May 6th, which is just right around the corner. I'm hoping all of our leaders can uh, still are still committed to those three-way uh, joint budget targets. Because that's, I think, when our uh, conference committee work will really begin. Senator and so Senator, we'll there's, a, there's a billboard on 35E that says Minnesota schools are worst for students of colors, for students of color. First of all, is that accurate? And second, what in your bill will address the disparities? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I have not seen that billboard. I don't know what the, you know, how, how they define worst. I can't really, I don't know what the background is on that. But let me tell you what I do know. Uh, teachers of color. Uh, was an initiative in 2017. It was a Republican Senate initiative. Actually, it was my initiative. And that is when we first started to address uh, the importance of teachers of color, looking at uh, how do we get more teachers of color in our classrooms. And so what we're doing in this bill, number one, we are building upon the foundation that we started in 2017. Number one, that looks at uh, making sure that um, we uh, do something that uh, hadn't been done before. And that is, when we have this concurrent enrollment where we have kids who are taking uh, post-secondary classes while they're in high school, would you believe that there was no teacher preparation course? None. 
Uh, and so we funded uh, concurrent enrollment in a teacher preparation course. So if we want to really reach kids and get more teachers of color, one of the best things we can do is uh, have those uh, high school kids have one of their options when they take a secondary class, uh, post-secondary class, uh, be able to have some education or teacher preparation. And uh, those of you who follow education know that one of the best ways to close that achievement gap that we have seen is uh, with the uh, concurrent enrollment, or the PSEO, or career tech education. Kids who uh, just take one CTE, or PSEO, or concurrent enrollment in our, in our students of color, we see graduation rates increase uh, by double digits. Uh, so number one, let's make sure that those classes offer teacher prep. Secondly, uh, we also do grow your own. We want to encourage encourage our paraprofessionals, many who uh, are uh, people of color. We want to uh, show them a pathway and help them get on the pathway to be licensed teachers. Uh, so those are just two of the things we do. Also, we give local school boards authority. If they want to pay hiring bonuses for teachers of color, we give them the authority to do that. We have defined the shortage areas to include teachers of color. What about though the students of color and the, and the disparities gap between white students and students of other ethnicities and backgrounds? Yes. Oh, we do have one of the worst and most persistent achievement gaps uh, in the nation. And we have talked about that for far too long. And we have not seen a significant increase in uh, those graduation rates. And that's why we focus on things that work, like uh, PSEO, uh, concurrent enrollment, as I said, career tech ed. You can get the numbers on that. Kids, uh, uh, in, you can look at whatever. Um, minority racial class you want to look at, and you will see that the graduation rates jump if those kids have been exposed to a post-secondary or concurrent enrollment classes. Um, I thought it was a little um, uh, not intuitive when I first looked at those numbers, but it truly is the case. So we do things uh, like that. Uh, then also we got to focus on things that work. Like I said, uh, we have about 40% of our kids that are not literate. Uh, and there we need to focus on um, making sure that we have reading instruction that actually uh, is based on scientific evidence-based reading. So we put some emphasis there. Um, and uh, in addition, we also know that uh, really, if we want kids to, if we want to close this achievement gap, we cannot start in kindergarten. We have to start with uh, early learning. And that's why we focused on that. The 40% figure, you don't mean 40% of all students. What subset are you referring to? I'm looking at our uh, MCAs. 40% of our students are not proficient in reading. Senator, it's time we change that. Sorry, I talked to a North Metro school district yesterday. They said with growing enrollment, growing special ed enrollment, contractual obligations, the half point percentage point on the formula means they're going to have to eliminate positions and have higher class sizes. Um, do you, can you respond to that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, um, we look at those things very closely. Uh, we don't have any control over contractual obligations, so let's just set that aside. That's a decision that the local school districts and their unions make. However, uh, we do have uh, the obligation to fund our students, and we, we realize that we fund on a per pupil basis, so if they're getting more students, there'll be more funding. One of the things we're also seeing, though, is that there's an increase in uh, the number of students needing special education services. And what we're also seeing uh, is that education, special education costs are far uh, increasing uh, above inflation or any other cost. And we really need to delve into that and look at why that is. That's one of the reasons that we focused, again, on things that work. For example, reading recovery has shown, again, that's um, an evidence-based, scientific-based reading method uh, developed here in Minnesota. Again, other states are emulating this. Uh, that actually has shown in uh, the you know gold standard of uh, studies with a control group and a like uh, group with the intervention have shown that kids that have uh, had reading core uh, have been less likely, same, same basic kids, uh, to be referred to special education. And they were able to put a dollar on it. And here in Minnesota, it was $9 million of foregone special education costs. And so we are laser focused on those things that work. One of those things would be uh, that early literacy. So your uh, advice to the school district is, Control your contractual obligations, otherwise not our problem. I mean, no, that is not. No, I, I, I've been, you know, uh, I'm just giving you one thing we can do is, fo what we can do is focus on things that work 
in our budget. And like I said, the school districts, they have to take care of those contractual costs. However, you know, um, y'all might remember the history of how our omnibus bills start. Um, clearly, you might remember 2009, I wasn't here then, but you might remember that uh, there was a zero and a zero percent increase on the formula. Um, and unfortunately, that stuck. Uh, in years after that, there were um, zero and one, one and zero. That's kind of what Governor Dayton uh, proposed going out of the gate. And then as you get into negotiations and we get those three-way budget targets, uh, then we will look at, um, at, at uh, looking at the per-pupil funding. Uh, so his history has shown that uh, the per pupil funding goes up as we get into negotiations. And that doesn't matter if it's a Republican or a Democrat uh, controlled body. That, that is the history here. And I believe that's because most of us realize that per pupil funding is the gold standard of education funding. It funds every student equally, regardless of zip code, and it gives local school districts the flexibility to know how to use those dollars. Did I understand you, excuse me, did I understand you to say there's no property taxes in this? Meaning, to, is there some type of a cap on local districts to do, do a mill levy referendum? Or? No, I'm saying that none of the provisions in the Senate education bill involve an increased levy. And the things that we are putting forth do not involve an increased levy. A number of things in the education bill that we fund, we have equalization levies uh, to make sure that property rich and property poor districts are treated fairly. We, there's nothing that increases levy. Is it okay to move on to another topic? Sure. Sure. Senator Gazoka, uh, on Monday you said the gun bills are dead. On Tuesday they passed them off the House floor. They did that while rejecting Republican amendments to increase the penalties on illegal transfers of guns. Are we on a collision course on this issue, and is it possible that this thing could stop the train? Well, they're not going to happen this year. I mean, that's part of the reason I said if the House will give them hearings and an up or down vote in the House, uh, we'll give them a hearing in the Senate and start the process. Um, I've always said over the last number of years, we have to keep our eye on the ball and focus on the things that we know we can all agree on. We all know that safe schools is an issue we can pour money into, which is why we're putting $75 million into safe schools. We all know that mental health is an issue, which is why we're putting more resources into mental health. So it really deals with more than just the gun issue. Uh, there are people passionate on that issue on both sides. Uh, some people want stand your ground on one side. Some people want universal background checks on the other side. Uh, in the end, uh, there will be one group or the other that stops those. And so I'm just saying let's focus on the main thing. First of all, is passing the two-year budget. You know, so I, we're, we're careful not to put too many volatile issues in our uh, budget bills. There are some that uh, will no doubt collide, and the House has the same thing. But at the end of the day, I think those things will have to, to move off of the budget bill so we can pass it to your budget. But because of those passions, is it possible that this could throw the session or this legislative session off track? Well, I think it depends on how stubborn people are wanting more than where we're at right now. Uh, I think you could see a lot of stalemate. I mean, that's the nature of divided government. Uh, that's not a bad thing. Minnesota seems to like it. Uh, so I'm trying to encourage the governor and, and the speaker, uh, some of the things that you're passionate about that we're not are going to have to go away. And I think they could say the same thing to me, that there are some things that we want that will likely go away. Got time for one more. Senator Macascaw. DNR, DNR has, is going to appeal the uh, Lake Bidet Macascaw, AKA Bidet Macasca, to, uh, to the Supreme Court. Um, any reaction to that? Well, I'm, I'm disappointed. I guess I would. I prefer to be decided in the legislative body, as the the language seems to be pretty clear. I, I know there there was at least uh, one journalist that looked it up and said it's pretty clear, uh, Pat Lopez. But uh, other I than also that, I looked at other statutes <laughs> and at the uh, 1964 Attorney General's opinion too. So there's some Thank conflict you. there. So, but so anyway, but we're gonna, they, that's their right to do it. Uh, you know, they're suing. Uh, you know, Commerce is suing PUC over Line Three pipeline. They can do all the kind of things they want to do, but. Uh, I wish the process would work the way it's meant to work. Senator, so, walk us through what happens now to, to, to meet with the governor, meet with the speaker, sure. to come this up with the This will be the last targets. question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's good. So today we pass our last two budget bills as promised. Uh, I've described it once as we're all lining up on a football field and now we're ready to hike the ball and two sides come together. Uh, but we are speaking, our, our chief of staffs are speaking from the House, Senate, and Governor. 
We're going to try to set up times for Thursday, Fridays, Saturday that we're going to meet and start talking about how do we make this work, how do we fit it together. Obviously, we're a long ways apart, uh, but at the same time, that's not unusual in Minnesota politics. And so uh, because of the players that are coming to the, the dance here, the governor, the, the speaker, and myself, I do believe we will find a pragmatic way to get through. I, I'm just encouraging people on big new ideas. You've got to lower your expectations. As uh, it's difficult for me, I want to fight for certain things that uh, and will. Uh, but in the end, uh, if one side or the other is not going to give, we have to pass it to your budget. That's our responsibility. Uh, and that's what I'm, not, I'm going to keep the eye on the ball. And that's what I'm going to ask the governor and the speaker to as well. So, but we are communicating. We are meeting. And that's a good sign. Thank you, Thank you guys. We've got to yeah. get going. We'll, uh, we'll, be able we'll to catch up with you later. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.